60 minutes. And after that, we ask to the public to write down on the chat or to just directly ask the question to you. And I will try to organize it with a certain order, but we have done that uh, the previous semester on the just storage. It did work. Perfect. Hello. Marvelous. <laughs> I don't know how to stop sharing. Does it? Uh, uh, okay. I think he has the, um, the slide frozen. Oh, this is a bit mm -hmm. damp. Can you try to move on forward uh, a little bit to see if. Okay. No, it works. Okay. Okay. It works. I just don't know how to turn off screen sharing for your introduction because I. Oh, sorry. Okay.
Okay, um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, webinar. Ora si registrerà la conferenza. On uh, geobiology. Um, as you can see, it is organized under the flag of the Italian Geological Society, Società Geologica Italiana. And the main scope is to try to give an overview on uh, a series of topics which are frontier between the geology and the biology, which is a theme now is becoming more and more recurrent and uh, more and more, I will say, important, especially with, the, with not only the planetary science, but also a whole series of um, result and uh, scientific results which are dealing between uh, uh, the biology and the geology and uh, relate to the origin of life, for example, or uh, extremophiles, so environment which are probably simulating or analog to what could happen in other planets. Now, as you can see, uh, today uh, we have the first uh, talk of the series, which is Karen Yoid. And uh, before I introduce her, um, I want just to show the whole series uh, which follow uh, every week at the same time. So Thursday, essentially, in between six and seven o'clock on the Rome time zone. And uh, as you can see by the title, we will cover various aspects which relate of the, uh, to the topics of the geobiology from the life, in other words, more aspect more related to the microbiology on the system herd to uh, aspect which relate to uh, the development of the microbial uh, growing across the subduction zone. And then the final talk will be by uh, Robert Hazen, which will uh, give an overview of the coevolution of life and rocks. So essentially, it's a whole series of themes which um, will help us to explore uh, those aspects and uh, those topics, which are uh, now uh, becoming essential uh, uh, to, the, to the geoscience and geological background. Now, just before I start the talk and introduce Karen Lloyd, I just want to give you a more, more or less what will work. It's essentially the talk will be at around uh, 40 minutes, after which we will have time for 20 minutes to interact and ask questions to Karen Lloyd. What will happen is that the person in the, which today will be myself and the next day will be my colleagues, which helped me to organize this session, which are Donato Giovannelli, Cavalazzi Barbari, and Parente Mariano, and uh, one of those will essentially guide you across the, the question and give you access to the, to the question after the talk. Okay, so I think it's time to uh, introduce the speaker of today, which uh, let's say is Karen Lloyd, which um, several of us uh, had already the pleasure to uh, appreciate across the series of famous TED Talks, and I guess uh, she will therefore entertain us today with their um, uh, fascinating uh, topics, which is marine sediment deep subsurface on the biosphere. And um, uh, Karen, she's professor at the University of Tennessee at the Department of Microbiology. She has uh, performed a long career across those topics. And uh, I think she did an uh, MSc and PhD on uh, marine sciences at the, the University of North Carolina. Then uh, she went back on the other side of Atlantic in Europe uh, for, uh, for a while in, in Denmark. And actually, she has on the frontier on the research of the topic which relates with the uh, all aspect of the sediment deep subsurface in that part of uh, in our planet. So I think that's it. I uh, give you the word, Karen. So I just uh, disappear. And uh, thank you very much for uh, for um, uh, give us us the chance to hear uh, um, what's happening in this part of uh, of the of the plan great thanks um i'm clicking the screen share now and it's not doing anything so i don't know if you need to give me permission or maybe yeah i don't seem to have the permission to screen share anymore okay you can give it Last to Fabio. It's grayed out. Please try <clears throat> try to go out and re-enter again. Okay.
you go. Very good. Okay, so I don't have the screen is still grayed out. Oh, now it's got it. Okay, now we can see your new screen. Okay, all right, uh, and you can hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you all for coming in to my talk. I'm gonna talk about the mysterious deep subsurface biosphere and what might sustain one of the largest, slowest ecosystems on Earth. Um, this is my favorite view of planet Earth. Um, <laughs> you can sort of play around with Google Earth and try to flip it around from the way we normally look at it and try to get a, a view that has no continents in it at all. Um, and it's a good, I like to do this with Earth because it's a good reminder that really most of Earth is covered by oceans. That's the, that's the major part of Earth. And if you look at the mud, the muck underneath all of these world's oceans and you add up the total number of microbial cells that are there, it's 10 to the 29 living microbial cells are buried in the seafloor. And I think that's a hard number to get our brain around, but just to put it in a setting, that's about a third of the total microbes on the planet. So if you want to study life on Earth, you actually need to be studying life that is inside Earth. Um, and that's something that I think is often neglected. So the way that we get samples of life that's inside Earth is one thing we do is we go out on a drill ship, such as the Joy Days Resolution shown here. Um, and it has this large drill stack um, that allows you to put up big long drill strings, um, send them through sometimes many hundreds of meters or a thousand meters of seawater to the ocean floor and then drill into the ocean floor. And if, so when you think about this, when you think about getting a sample, you want to look at some microbes, these individual bacteria and archaea that are living deep, many hundreds of meters below the seafloor through many hundreds of meters of seawater, and you're dragging it up on this big rusty ship. Probably the first thing you should be thinking is, those things are going to be really contaminated with other types of microbes. So really, this is a major question that we have when we do this sort of research. How do you keep microbes from the surface from contaminating your samples with drill fluid. So we actually use seawater as the drill fluid. And we do this in two ways. One way is actually through the type of drilling that we do. So shown on the left here is um, an advanced piston core shoe. So this is the drill bit that we use to drill into the seafloor. This is the part that actually introduces seawater into things and contaminates things. But once you get um, that set up and you're drilled into the seafloor, then you can send down the advanced piston core, which is just a hollow tube of plastic. And you shove that down with one um, very powerful stroke detonated from the ship. And that shoots it about nine and a half meters in about two and a half seconds. It's a very powerful move. Um, but what it means is that you can go through sediment and core sediment without actually shooting contaminating seawater down the sides of it. So that's the first thing that we do is we do advanced piston coring when we can. And the second thing we, we do, which is perhaps even more important, is that we put a tracer into the seawater. So when you're drilling, you add this perfluorocarbon tracer. And so what this does is that it volatilizes. Wherever it seeps into your core, you can then take a sample out, inject it into a gas chromatograph, and see if any of it seeped in. And so we take these samples from the outside, the middle, and the inner part across a cross section of these core barrels. And we do it in each of the sections of this nine and a half meter core. So we have one hockey puck, one whole round core from each section of these long, um, almost 10 meter cores. And the data often are very good with advanced piston coring, where in the exterior, you will sometimes get a little bit of a tracer coming in um, and a little less halfway, but then in the center, you often get below detection limit tracer. So what this means is that in the middle of the core, we can sample these cores and they're uncontaminated by drilling fluid. And it means that we actually have the power to get true good samples from this very remote location. Um, so now that we know that we can sample the deep subsea floor aseptically, what's down there? What do we find? Um, so I'll show you what, what we find, um, not by telling you the names of the microbes uh, for this way, I'll just show you boxes to say what we found. So this is the location that I'm going to show you um, 
samples from. This is uh, off the coast of Peru. It's along the Peru continental margin. This is the first sort of aseptic drilling expedition. And I got the chance to work on this when I started in my PhD program. And I'll show you the data with a bright blue box for a type, if, we got, if, if the type of um, microbe that we retrieved is the same strain that some other microbiologist discovered, or if it's something really new that no one's ever cultured before, I'll show it in a white box like this. And we pulled the, um, we looked for the DNA of these microbes. So what we found with DNA sequences, each of these box represents a different group of microbes. We found that none of them were bright blue. None of them were similar to what somebody else had found before. In fact, a few of them were totally new, really strange, deep branches on the tree of life that we'd never seen before. So, I mean, this is a cool thing. You go and you drill a place that nobody's ever drilled aseptically before. You apply a new technique that nobody's ever applied to this place before. And you find a bunch of really novel stuff. Well, as microbiologists, the first thing, the, the very next step is obviously that you want to culture this and, and get them into pure culture and study them. Um, so luckily there were people on board who were doing culturing work too. And I'll show you the results that they came up with. Every time they get one of these, I'll show you the new box underneath it um, in the next row down. And any new ones, I'll pile up on the end here. So that's the results of culturing. Got nothing. <laughs> we, we saw absolutely nothing that we got with the DNA sequences in the cultures. And furthermore, the cultures were kind of like what everybody else has gotten before. Um, and it, it actually was, um, was done by two labs. So we had another lab um, that actually was using more, um, sort of like a better an anaerobic technique, I think. Um, so that lab, I'll show their results next to it. They also got no overlap with what we found with the DNA sequences. So it really wasn't possible to use um, to use the standard methods to try to grow these things in, in culture. And that has led us to sort of term these new weird things microbial dark matter. So I've also, um, I wanted to know if you could count up this microbial dark matter and see, you know, so this, this method that we did here was just to find them. We weren't very quantitative with it. I wanted to know, can you count them up and see how many of these new microbial dark matter um, microbes are there? And so we did this study where we took all the, from public databases, we downloaded all the bacteria from all marine subsurface metagenomes um, that are present in public databases and counted them up. And we found that this tiny yellow slice here were the cultured ones. These are cultured genera. Everything else here is something that has, um, is either a novel genus to class or a novel phylum. Um, and this is um, as close to quantitative as we can get right now. So it's really most of them. And that's the bacteria. And the archaea have the same sort of thing. There's very few of them have been brought into culture. But I also want to make the point that I don't want to imply that just because something has been grown in lab before that we know everything about it. So these little yellow wedges here are still something that we need to study out in nature. And there's still a lot of mysteries about even the cultured stuff. Um, an analogy that I like to use is, if you were a lion ecologist and you wanted to study lions or a lion physiologist, and you only ever studied lions in a zoo, then you would say, oh yes, the purpose of lions is to sit around all day and to eat little dead circles of meat. Actually, we know that they hunt, <laughs> but you would never know about hunting because you hadn't studied them in the wild. So um, even for these known microbes, the cultured ones, I think it's really important to study them in the wild and see what they do there. Um, so if you look at this whole ecosystem and you look at what's powering it, like what's, what's the fuel that's, that's feeding this system? Um, it's often uh, processes called sulfate reduction and methanogenesis, um, but some of my colleagues did a calculation and estimation of the total amount of power, so that's the rate at which energy is delivered across all the marine sediments worldwide. And this arrow points out the watts, or the power per cell, that are the lowest experimentally measured maintenance energy for a microbe in a laboratory. So maintenance energy is just barely enough energy to survive, not enough energy to divide. These microbes in the subsurface are one to three orders of magnitude less powered than even that. So really, um, it appears that by and large, this is a huge ecosystem and there's not enough power there to support even a single amount of cell division, which is pretty wild when you think about it. And what you would predict from this is that if there's not enough power to divide, 
then actually as time goes on, as sediments layer up, as they pile up and get buried lower and lower in, in depth, you should see fewer and fewer cells because all they can do is die. They're never gonna grow their populations. And that's exactly what we see. Pretty much everywhere you go, this covers a lot of different oceans. And these are total cell counts with depth. Up here would be the seafloor and then going deeper and deeper with, with the log um, distribution, we see a decrease in the number of cells with depth pretty much everywhere we go. Um, which led my first graduate student to coin a term which I really, really like. Um, he said, you know, this is not, we're not studying a biome, Karen. We're studying a diome, because they're all dying. <laughs> and it makes you, may make you say like, well, what's the point of studying it? This is, <laughs> they're all gonna die. So what's the point? Um, this is permanent dormancy. Um, but there is a point, even though they're dying, they're not dead and they are doing stuff down there. They are consuming organic matter. They're breathing respiratory substrates. This is um, just to illustrate one thing that they do. These are um, individual samples from all the world's oceans showing at which depth sulfate is depleted. So they, um, they pull down sulfate. And what this does is that this alters the redox state of marine sediments worldwide. So even something doing a very small thing and barely breathing in one tiny place, when multiplied across the globe, has a huge effect on, on global systems. And that's why we study them. So how do they do it? How do these bacteria and archaea persist without growing, yet alive state for thousands of years in marine sediments? And I know you probably know of old animals, you know, or old trees. There's um, the sequoias last for maybe a thousand years or so. Um, but individual cells within the sequoia don't last for thousands of years. They turn their cells over at a normal rate. This is individual cells that last for thousands of years. So how do they do it? Um, this is kind of still open for debate whether they're actually adapted to do this or whether this is just an accident. I mean, I, I've heard people say this, that, you know, it's not that they, you know, are good at being there. It's just that it just happens. They just, they just don't die. And, and that's, you know, it's not an adaptation. So I would like to show you our evidence that there are actual adaptations to this long-term dormancy. So this comes from a project um, led by my first graduate student, Jordan. Um, this is uh, through IODP. This is this um, mission-specific platform um, through ECORD, um, the European um, International Ocean Drilling Program. And they sampled these three sites in around uh, Scandinavia in the Baltic Sea and they drilled um, into 8,000 year old sediments. And I'm not gonna go through all the, the whole study because it's a very complicated study. I'll just show you the highlights of what we found that we think are adaptations. So we looked for evidence of the activity of these populations using genomes, so that's all the genes that they have, um, metabolites, small um, chemicals that show that their met metabolisms are functioning. We looked at their transcripts, so looking at RNA, which tells you what's about to get turned into proteins, and we did direct activity assays to show their, their functions um, directly. So we, we put all these data together and came up with a set of adaptations that we think they have. Um, one is that we think they are repairing their DNA through NAD consumption mechanisms. NAD is a um, cofactor. If you've studied the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, you know that this is that redox electron carrier that um, either gets oxidized or reduced, um, but in their case, they're breaking it apart and destroying it. Um, we found a bunch of evidence that they had active pathways for resupplying their NAD because they were pulling it out to repair their DNA. Um, and this is something that we see across the different organisms that are there. We see that they are accumulating a lot of osmoprotectants. And these could be about um, regulating salt content inside the cell, but they could also be um, just something to sort of make them sluggish and slow down their, their total um, metabolism. These, um, one of them is trehalose, which if you add it to C. elegans, it actually increases the lifespan of the worm. Um, so these are, these are a potential way that they're dealing with um, not, not dying. <laughs> um, and sort of most interestingly, I think, we found ecology. <laughs> we found that different microbes seem to occupy different nutritional niches rather than everybody, because everybody's starving, right? So you should think, well, everything should be able to eat every type of carbon just in case they find a, a piece of food they can eat it. But instead, we found that some of them will eat one thing and others eat other things. And we think that maybe this is an adaptation to reduce competition so they don't just actively kill each other. 
Um, and then the sort of last thing we found is that this most abundant clade, um, which is an uncultured, um, there actually is one culture now, finally, um, but it's still a mostly uncultured phylum, con consumes a um, chemical compound called allantoin, which is an enriched degradation product of DNA. Um, and the possibly the strangest thing was when we looked at the expression of transcripts from this organism, the second most highly produced enzyme, as far as we could see, was an enzyme for an exporter for amino acids. So this is a, um, a place where there's not enough energy to grow, and the second most highly transcribed protein that this organism has is a sharing um, protein. So it gives amino acids out to other organisms. <laughs> so it, it seems uh, uh, that's, a, that's an inference. It may not actually be doing that, but it appears that they seem to be doing centripes and, and helping each other. Um, so and well, sorry. Um, so the other bit of evidence that we have that this um, these types of organisms are really adapted to live in low low energy environments is from another project that I'm I'm not going to go deeply into this project um, that was run by my um, recently graduated PhD student Katie Seitz in Siberia. Um, this is the oldest um, permafrost on Earth, and it's it's been frozen continuously for a million years. And she pulled out the first uh, metagenome assembled genomes from this um, from this these permafrost, and she found the same groups of organisms that we commonly find in deep subsurface marine sediments, um, which we totally didn't expect to find. And these uh, the permafrost we were working in was not near the ocean, and it had not been marine at any point in its its life. So. Um, this is another little piece of evidence that maybe these clades are especially adapted to be good at living in places where they can't really grow. So this is crazy. How can an organism be adapted to an environment where it does not grow? Darwin said they had to grow. You have to pass your genes along to the next generation, otherwise natural selection doesn't occur. Um, it, it is bonkers, it's, it's ridiculous to suggest that you can be adapted to not grow. Um, so what we need to do is we need to find where, literally on Earth, what kind of environments do we find these microbes actually growing? Um, because they're not growing in this big place where we're studying them. So where is the place that they get to pass their genes along and do natural selection? And our first guess should be seawater. Um, because marine sediments are formed by stuff raining down from seawater and piling up on itself. So that's, that's our first guess. But if we look at the composition of microbes in seawater over here and compare them to the composition of microbes in sediments and put them in an ordination plot where things that are closer together are more similarly related, things that are farther apart are more distantly related, we find that there's very little overlap in the types of microbes that we find in these two places. It's, um, we would have a very different situation if all of the microbes in, this, in the mud were just a subset of what was up in the seawater. Um, we'd have a different sort of way of looking at things. But actually what we find in the mud is that totally different than what's up in the seawater. So that's dead. So another po possibility is that they grow cryptically in deep subsurface sediments. What I mean by this is if you look at a population that's decreasing with depth, so I said total cells decrease with depth, right? So the total amount of microbes is smaller here at one centimeter than it is at zero centimeters. And if all of the different groups, like the red group here, is decreasing by some proportion of their total size, every, every clade is decreasing in abundance as you go down. But another possibility is, even though the total number of cells has decreased in the same way here, it could be that the decrease is huge in the gray group, but there's actually an increase in the red group. So this is what I mean by a cryptic increase. But um, the same group from URI uh, checked this question out too and also showed that this can't be true because they compared shallow sediments to deep sediments. And what they found was that um, the, only the organisms that are abundant in deep sediments are the ones that were abundant in shallow sediments. So it's not that you get um, a blossoming of a new population. You just It's still just like a um, die-off of some percentage of the total population size that you have. So that's wrong too. Um, so we don't have them growing there. So what's left? And I was, um, I was at uh, ASM, the American Society for Microbiology meeting um, years ago, and I was meeting up with a colleague of mine from Denmark. Um, I had moved back to the States and I was having dinner with him and I said, 
where do they grow? I just don't understand how you can have a whole population of things that doesn't grow anywhere. And he said, ah, this is Andy Schramm, who I was meeting with. He said, I know where they grow. <laughs> they grow in the upper 10 centimeters of sediments. And I, I thought, this is crazy. I'm talking about the deep subsurface. I'm, we take big drill ships. We, we drill hundreds of meters down into sediments. They can't just grow, you know, this far down. Um, but he said, yes, but think about it. That's the best place for them to eat because that's the freshest food and that's the, the best chance they'll ever have it growing. So I think that's where they grow. And then very quickly they stop growing and then they just wait the whole rest of the time. And I thought, that's crazy, but it is a testable hypothesis and I can test it. So I worked with, this is my summer crew, this is my whole lab for a, um, a summer, I think in 2017. And one of them, so my um, recently graduated PhD student, Richard Kevorkian, came up with a method to quantify microbes, microbes in marine sediments. Quantifying total numbers of microbes is relatively easy, but quantifying different types of microbes in sediments is very hard. And that's just because of the methods that we use to detect them involve a lot of amplification and things that mess up any, um, our ability to actually count them accurately. So what he came up, he and I came up with is if you want to get at the absolute abundance for the red clay, for the red type of microbes at say zero centimeters depth, you can do your total cell count. We can measure this. You can also get the fraction of the DNA sequences that you get out of this organism. We can get this. But then you have to multiply it by this unknown X factor of how much bias did you have when you were pulling out the DNA and amplifying it. And then you get to the real amount, which in this case would be two. Um, but you can't actually figure out what this number is because you don't know what this DNA extraction bias number is. But what we can do is we can measure it in the next layer down, where here you have a different cell count and you have a different percentage of the sequences but this extraction bias is actually pretty similar to what it was before. So in this case, and then you can get this total amount, or theoretically you would be able to get this total amount. So in this case, what we wanna know is the, the total amount that we get out, but when, when we have a situation where we have two equations that have an unknown that we can't measure, but it's the same unknown in both those equations, we can divide one by the other and, the value that's the same blanks out to one. So this, um, we can't use this to get the, we can't use this to determine that there are two cells in, at zero centimeters, but we can use it to determine that there was a twofold increase with that. So it allows us by putting them in ratios, we can talk about fold increases in a quantitative way um, without, without knowing how biased we are, without ever having to measure that value. Um, but we make the assumption that that value, value does not change much over depth. Um, so we decided to test this by going to um, one of my favorite study sites in North Carolina. This is close to where I grew up in the White Oak River estuary. And so we took cores that look like this and we sampled them in one centimeter intervals to see if we could see increases over the upper 10 centimeters. So we applied that, that equation that I, that I just showed you <laughs> and I will show you the data that resulted from this in this way. Um, this is a pretty weird plot, so I want to orient you to it before I give you the data. <laughs> this is not an ordination plot, even though it looks like it. This is the data from one of the cores on the x-axis, and then replicate data from a different core on the y-axis. The positive numbers are doubling times of the cells that increased with depth. The negative numbers are the half-lives of cells that decreased with depth. depth. And since I'm comparing two cores here, and I'm doing something that is really new. We don't really know if it works well. So um, I have to basically um, be uh, wary of it at all times. So if this method is any good at all, then the core should agree about the same type of microbe. It should grow in this core and it should grow in that core and it should show up in this quadrant. Or it should die in this core and die in that core and show in this quadrant. Any data that shows up in this quadrant and that quadrant is bad data. Um, it means that our method is kind of crappy. So the first time I plotted this, I just threw the data into this plot to see, okay, how, how messy is it gonna be? I was shocked. It falls beautifully into matching net growth and matching net death. There's almost nothing that shows up in the wrong places. So actually we got really good agreement out of these two cores. And so the next thing I want you to see about this 
is that some of these types of microbes I have very bright colors for, very vibrant colors, and others have these pastel colors. I chose pastel colors for soil microbes, aerobic surface microbes, and I show, chose bright colors for the types of microbes that we tend to find in the deep subsurface. These are ones like we got in um, Peru margin. And what you'll see is that the vibrant things tend to be on the side of net growth and the pastel light colored things tend to be on the side of net death. So what this is suggesting is that we're actually catching growth, like population increases in deep subsurface types of microbes while the surface world is dying off. And we also looked at how closely related they were to a cultured organism. Things that were pretty well cultured get an X, things that are totally novel phyla get a dot, and you can see most of the dots are growing and most of the Xs are dying off. And the last sort of gut check we did on this, where things fall in this plot, is that we took all the ones with Xs and said, well, are they, can they use air? Are they oxygen, do they use oxygen? Are they aerobes or are they not? And we found that of the ones that are aerobes, um, the only aerobes that we found are the ones that were dying. Um, we didn't find any aerobes in the growing ones. So that's, that's good evidence because there's no oxygen there. They shouldn't be growing. Um, but this is, this is one way of measuring it. We, you know, this is this new method. And like I said, we're very wary of it. So we also did some quantitative PCR to back it up, um, which is a totally different way of measuring this fold changes. And um, quantitative PCR is a little slower throughput. You can only do it for a few clades. But for the ones that we were able to get data from, we got very nicely matching um, turnover times, um, uh, of about 10, 10 years for this one group, Bathyarchiota, and four to five years for MBGD. Um, again, didn't totally trust this method, so we did it another way. <laughs> we actually took sediments and let them sit on the lab bench for two years, and then to see if we could see the turnover happen in real time and not depend on um, you know, because we had to make an assumption about sedimentation rates to get um, for the fold increases with depth to turn that into fold increases over time. And here we too found a good agreement between our two incubations. And um, we found that some of them were growing and some were dying. And we found that the doubling times and half-lives were still in the year ranges. So these very, very slow. Um, and I don't think I really made a point of that with the, with the last work, but um, something uh, doubling over a year or 10 years means that it's way too slow to ever grow on a lab bench. That's just incredibly slow. Um, and so some of these, obviously this didn't go out as long as the white oak, as the, um, in the sedimentary ones did, just because we only let them sit for two years and we couldn't measure um, changes that were smaller than, than that. Um, but we did have some organisms that were present in both of these, in the, both the incubations and the down core plots. And for those, oh, sorry, forgot that I said, um, also the um, aerobes were only dying. They were not growing on this one as well. Um, so now if we compare the turnover times that we see in the um, uh, incubations, we find that actually they're not too bad. 10 years in the natural sediment, six years in the, um, in the incubations. They're pretty different for, for this group, but they're still growing. Um, and they're actually surprisingly similar in the two experiments for MDGD and these other ones. Um, so this all led up to us believing that we actually could see growth. So we have the types of bacteria and archaea that are commonly found in deep marine sediments actually increase in actual population, not just relative abundances, and they're not just replacing their broken bits in the upper few centimeters. So that's where they grow. So if that's the growth zone in the upper 10 centimeters, how does being able to grow in the upper 10 centimeters of sediment allow you to be adapted to long-term survival in over thousands of years of burial? And so here's the, the sort of model that I'm proposing. Um, if we have this where there's water up at top and blue and the gray is sediments, and we've got the shallow zone of growth that get to pass through that and at that point um, you pass your genes along and you can do natural selection if you're more fit. Um, anything that gets buried below this growth zone and happens to have an adaptation that allows it to persist and have a higher population size, anything that returns it to the surface and allows it to go to the growth through the growth zone again will have a better chance of passing those genes along to the next generation and then they will have adaptations. Um, 
so yeah, so any anything that can survive um, better deeper down can can do better when it comes back up. The question is, how do things come back up? Well, a big storm can resuspend sometimes a half a meter of sediment. So that's actually a pretty good resuspension. So that all gets kicked up into the seawater and settles back down again. Um, but if you imagine it happening over even longer time scales, um, slumps and movements and turbidite flows and um, slope failures could all lead, um, could all bring up something that's buried even a hundred meters down to actually be pulled back up to the surface again. And to take into the really extreme, you could actually come back up in a subduction zone um, once a oceanic plate is being subducted under a continental plate through accretionary prisms or mud volcanoes or all the things that sort of mix up the sediments when that happens. Um, but that's a really long, long term. So my conclusions are, is that there is a massive subsea floor biosphere and the things that are there are not common in the surface world. And they do have special adaptations um, to live an extremely low power non-growing lifestyle. And we think that they may be adapted for life in the subsurface by growing in the shallow su subsurface. Like once they hit the shallow place, they can grow and then that's it. Um, so thank you for listening to me. I don't know if I was on time, I guess maybe a little, little fast, but that's always, people always appreciate that. Um, this is a picture of my university here. Um, we're right on the Tennessee River and my lab is overlooking the river and this pretty bridge. And I've gotten lots of great funding over the years from all these groups. And I appreciate um, getting a chance to talk to you guys and I welcome your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, fascinating talk, uh, very clear, very neat. Um, uh, before I move to the questions, I just want to remind the people that we have a YouTube uh, a record in there. So anyone want to uh, um, rewatch um, the presentation at his perusal, he can uh, he can use the YouTube uh, channel where I uh, say hello to the people that have been watching from there. So I will rather move uh, to questions. Anyone have a question to the speaker? And I will start now the the discussion. Before people start to ask questions, Karen, I have to say I'm very ignorant on these topics, but uh, till a certain part of the talk, I was thinking that some of the <laughs> microbial fauna were kind of zombie. They are not replicating. They stay in a place uh, where very, very poorly organized. They just eat fresh food. But then the second part, you explain a little bit better how it works on the, on the, the slight tiny surface of the, of the sediment. Fascinating. Yeah, I want to emphasize that that's that's a hypothesis. <laughs> you know, this is not something that um, yeah. people who are very familiar with the deep subsurface would say, oh, yes, yes, everybody knows that. We agree with that. I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious to hear what people have to say if, yeah. if they think my idea is nuts. I think the first question is by Donato. I don't know if Donato can uh, access the microphone in a way or in another. Pretty sure he can. Hi, David. Yes, I'm here. I wasn't sure if you wanted us to ask questions directly. Yeah, yeah. Or not. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the talk. I, I have a question. I, I know we spoke about this before, but I just want to get a feeling for me and everybody else. Is there an upper estimate on the time this cell might live in sediments? Do we have maximum numbers some people try to put on their age? And how over overlapping are we geological processes happening in sediments and shallow crust? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I always think of the upper limit for something living in sediments today as being about 150 to 200 million years, because the oldest sediments, the oldest extant sediments right now are that old. Um, but I just saw a paper come out, um, I believe yesterday that I haven't read yet, that put an upper limit on the oldest cells of a billion years, which is um, impressive. <laughs> so did, I get, did I get you correct? Cell that have been continuously living within quote because we're not sure you know how active they are over the entire time span but for a billion years there's a paper that just came out about that yeah i'll i'll yeah i i well i don't know i can maybe find it when somebody's asking the next question or something but um um i maybe i um now that i say that i think that's what they concluded but i haven't read the paper so i shouldn't i shouldn't say it. i should probably should not have said that but definitely the upper limit is at least 150 million years 
because yeah, we, even we under 50 million survive. years is incredible. Thank That's you. That's actually incredible for a single cell to to just survive. And they, in that way, they're kind of like living fossils. People use that term for lineages that branched off very early, like a crocodile or something like that, a living fossil. But but that's not really a living, like a living fossil is something that was there, that was born in the Cretaceous and um, is still alive today. So that's, that's actually how we could study them. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Other questions? Please don't be shy. <laughs> No one is. Uh... Maybe they all think my theory is terrible and don't want to say it. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Karen, then I have a question uh, on now a serious question about I, I mean, how you can trace back those population in the geological history? Because I guess you get information as far as you've got a piece of DNA that you can trace back. But you, I guess it's not that easy. I mean, or you can date uh, those population. It's, it's a theoretical reconstruction or we do have some kind of uh, data uh, nailing those, uh, these answer. Yeah, it's hard to date the actual organism. You can date the environment that they're in relatively well, but you don't really know whether that's a descendant of what was actually there or whether it's the actual original cell. As far as I know, there's only one type of um, microbe that you can actually figure out its age, which is yeast. You know, the, the types of yeast that we um, make bread and alcohol with will actually, like when they divide asexually, they leave bud scars on their cells. So you can count the number of bud scars and see how old a yeast is. And I, I got really excited about that. And I was talking to a yeast biologist years ago and I was like, well, how old are they? And they're like, they're really old. I was like, all right, how old? And they're like, they can live for months. Like, oh. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's cool. David, we, we have a question on YouTube. I don't know if you're seeing YouTube chat. Ah, no, I don't see. In fact, there no. is another. I have it in front of me. If you want, I can read it. Uh, please go ahead, Donato, because I can so... see. I can... The question is from James Bradley. He's asking, can you say more about the different carbon sources these survivors are using? Does it relate to the carbon that is preserved in sediments? Yeah, I mean, it should relate, right? Because what they're not accessing is what gets preserved. Um, but what we, when we were looking at the different ones eating different types of food, we were just looking broadly ac across classes of carbohydrates and peptidases or peptides. So, um, I don't know how specific they get um, for the, I don't know how specific their extracellular enzymes are for specific substrates. Some of them tend to be um, fairly uh, promiscuous. They can get lots of different substrates, um, but they're at least sort of limited to the basic classes that we can see. But I, I think, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think that there's a whole lot we don't know about their preferences for organic matter setting what gets buried and, you know, what, what, is, what sticks around. I found that paper, by the way. <laughs> it's by Henrik Drake and Peter Reiners. Um, but what they did was they showed that the only, the longest um, continuously habitable spaces on Earth were a billion years. So that's a theoretical limit on how long a cell could live would be a billion years because everything over, over a longer time scale, there's no habitat that was stable enough throughout that, that time. Uh, hi, sorry. Can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Um, I, I was um, I was wondering since um, so first of all, great talk. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you um, everything you spoke about is um, very recent and very new. And I was wondering if you could expand on um, how you think we could advance this field and what is next for this field of research. Yeah, um, I'm not the I'm not sure what comes next for testing this hypothesis. Um, but what I, I thought of doing is to try to make models 
um, from a microbial perspective of particles and look at the probability of a particle getting moved back up at different depth layers in different places in the ocean. So sort of look, look at like propensity, like what are your, over what time scales are you likely to be pushed back to the surface at which depths in which places? And that, that sort of um, modeling from the perspective of a sediment particle is not how people normally model um, sediment transport in um, marine sediments. And so, I don't know. I think that's, that's something that I think about a lot. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Do you have ideas for the next steps going forward? Well, personally, no, but that's why I asked. I was very interested since these are new methods and even for students, it's not something you hear about often and something you don't think about very often. So I was curious. Well, I think, I think the other thing that going forward we really need to focus on is looking at these adaptations. Um, you know, anytime we find a new type of environment that life can be in, we make big discoveries. So when people discovered extremophiles and hydrothermal vents, it led to the discovery of TAC polymerase, which is the enzyme that we use to do almost everything we do with DNA. It's an um, incredibly powerful um, enzyme. So if we look more carefully into the physiology of these very, very slow, stable, long-term organisms, I think we're going to find mechanisms and proteins that are useful or um, can instruct us on, on other things. Okay, thank you. Karen, how about their biogeochemical impacts? Uh, you mentioned sulfate depletion and uh, obviously uh, organic matter diagenesis. Uh, you were talking about carbon sources. How about the other impact on other cycles? Do we have that figured out or still we don't know what's their global impact being varied? What's, what's your take on it? Yeah, I, I, I think we don't have that figured out at all. Um, I think it really, um, that question of, of how they, how they set pH, how they set redox, which is going to affect all the metals. And, you know, it's just a complex system where you see protection of various um, functional groups via um, uh, binding with other constituents. It's just, it's a really, it's a complex system. And I don't say that to um, be depressing. I find lots of possibilities in that. Um, there's a lot of really cool things to figure out about this. Uh, Karen, there are another couple of questions which uh, Fabio had posted on the chat, so I'm, I'm reading them. Can I ask you what is the chemical composition of this kind of soil? What is the concentration of nitrogen? I'm just curious about the relationship between acrobacteria and other microorganisms. That's one question. The next one, I'll read it after. Yeah, so if you look at total nitrogen in these systems, there's quite a lot of it, you know, especially compared to anything in the surface. Um, sediment systems tend to be, or even agricultural soils that are more active. Um, you find sometimes millimolar concentrations of ammonium, for instance. So um, they're usually not limited by substrates, by N or P or C. Um, they're usually limited by energy more so. And I don't know for certain that they are sharing, that they're doing centrifuges. Although the, um, the enrichment of atrobacteria that was in um, uh, Kamigata's group has um, shown that they do seem to have some centrifuges that are required for life um, in culture. So maybe we were onto something. Okay, thank you. That was from Luca Tonietti. And then there is another question, which I'm, I hope I can read it properly. It's about Ra uh, Raffaella D'Ambra. Um, she asked if a recent new movement on the Northeast principle plate subsurface has given new biological sediment, which I don't know what does it mean really, but maybe <laughs> it's something. <laughs> so like plate movements exposing new environments? So, yeah, I guess that is the question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that um, when you are dealing with life that functions over such long time scales, you kind of have to realize your own biases when you think about what affects biology. We don't think about a single organism being adapted to survive something that happens like a glacial cycle. You know, that we wouldn't have that. But we don't think about like a lineage of bears being able to be adapted to a glacial cycle because that's, that's ridiculous. Um, but um, for microbes, for individuals that live this long, that could happen. So counting on having it having a life that depends on getting um uh, 
up, uplifted when plates shift is, is reasonable for them. Interesting. Gary, I have, a, I have another question. I'm just following the logic of all your uh, uh, slides that you're presenting. I mean, if if those uh, um, um, microbial, uh, I would say you call it colonies, I don't know what you call it, uh, they, they have their own habitat, they, they, they are found essentially on the upper of the two centimeter of the deep water sediment. Now, those, those microbial, I mean, as far as we know, how do they relate with the other extremophile that you see on her? Because my question is, that means that those start to exist only when deep water sedimentation start to be triggered on the earth. Therefore, are we tracing back till the point where we start to have some traces of the first deep water system? Mm. Which is not, I mean, still debated, uh, but can be long way times. How do yeah. you work out those information? And how do you relate them in a way or in other from a biological point of view? Because I'm my brain or with archaea. So wh when do you, when did you appear those uh, microbial yeah. on, on, on the deep water sediment, the one that you have described? Yeah, those are, those are excellent questions. I mean, it, it does seem like the formation of the oceans on Earth would be a limiter on how old they can be, like when they first appeared on Earth but they do have these similarities to things we see in the terrestrial environment as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be that, you know, their lineage originated in th the terrestrial subsurface or, um, you know, it, it could be either way. It could have gone from one direction to the other. Um, I'm not sure, but I, that's something that I would like to know more about. I'm pretty ignorant about exactly when we got oceans on Earth and how that can be related to, to the deep branches of these, of these lineages. But, that's that's why this is like exactly why I have to talk to more geologists. Interesting. Any other question? Uh, Donato is right, right in uh, could be just crystal origin and getting to soil sediment later. Well, uh, crystal origin and getting the sediments later. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Chance to till uh, some chance to ask question to Karen. We won't see her that often. <laughs> yeah. The problem that people are writing things on different platforms, so I need to. If there aren't uh, any questions, I have to, I'm forced, obliged to uh, conclude this uh, fascinating talk, uh, I have to say. And uh, I have to thank you very much, uh, Karen, for uh, the time, for uh, having offered this talk. Um, from, my, from my side, it's, uh, it's something, something that is forcing me to rethink uh, <laughs> science, uh, natural art science in different way. It has been a little bit the uh, motivation to organized with Donato, with Barbara Cavalazzi, which is there, and Mariano, those series of talk. Uh, I thank you very much for your, for your talk. I hope one day we will manage to organize a similar talk in this part of the planet uh, face to face and have a proper dinner and uh, <laughs> in the Naples, uh, Napoli side. And um, at the moment, thank you very much. And thank you for the great talk. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Before um, we all leave, uh, I just introduce you to the next talk next week, which will be Ariel Lambar, and uh, I think she will be uh, or Mariano Donato introducing him, and is again back looking for life in other words, a biochemical perspective. So we continue along this kind of philosophical approach in this direction. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate for your attending this. Uh, this talk and I wish you a nice, a pleasant evening. Um, thank you very much again. Bye.